Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Reedy. I'm the CEO and founder of Scale Computing. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I'm just going to take you through a little bit about scale. I recognize that scale may be unfamiliar uh, to many of you, but we have been in business for uh, the better part of 17 years, um, primarily as an alternative to VMware, which is something which is very relevant uh, these days. And so, you know, what I want to talk to you today about is kind of the, the implications of what's happened with Broadcom and VMware and to show you a path uh, to something different and, and I would argue something quite a bit better. And it's one of those things where we can take a, a bad situation with Broadcom and maybe turn it into something that actually advances where you are taking your organizations uh, moving forward. At its core, uh, our product is, is called SC Platform. And SC Platform is a platform for running your applications. So it is a combination of virtualization, containerization, servers, and storage. You're going to see as I get into a demo here, a high availability is at the, the very core of everything that we do. Um, so you're going to see this combination of kind of ease of use highlighted there with uh, the simplicity icon uh, ease of use combined with high availability, um, because ultimately, right, it, it's not about the underlying technologies that make the uh, make your applications work. It's about making those applications stay up and running and, and allowing those applications to do great things for your organizations. You know, we have been been around for a long time. For those that, that may be familiar with scale, uh, we've sort of been known as one of the players in hyperconvergence. A hyperconvergence is um, what's used for the underlying storage layer, uh, but there's so much more to scale than just that. In fact, what's unique about scale is underpinning everything that we do uh, is an AI ops layer called AIM, A-I-M-E. And, and what AIM does is it's designed to monitor your entire infrastructure and look for the patterns that indicate uh, that something is broken or even that something is breaking. Uh, and then it will take the steps uh, using um, what's called finite state machines. Uh, it will take the steps that an administrator might take uh, to bring things back into a healthy state. That's a long-winded way of saying it's a self-healing architecture. So it's self-healing, it's highly available, and it's extraordinarily easy to use, which um, you'll see as we get into things. Again, we've been talking about the the Broadcom and VMware transaction for quite some time now. You can see the uh, the quote here from Gartner going all the way back uh, to May of 2022. And what certainly happened over the last six months or so since this transaction's closed is we've seen, you know, significant changes in uh, VMware's product roadmap and product offering, significant changes in terms of pricing. Uh, I've seen probably on average customers looking at three to four times price increases uh, since that transaction's closed. I've seen as high as 16 and 18 times price increases. Um, so maybe you find yourself in a similar situation, and that's what brings you to taking a look at, at scale today. I'm, I'm happy to say, if even if this is the first time you've seen us, that we've got customers all over the world, uh, and we are extraordinarily highly rated. Uh, we're covered by all the major analysts that you would see out there. Uh, and we have customers across a wide variety of industries, from manufacturing and retail to education and government. Um, you know, we have thousands of customers globally, and tens of thousands of deployments. Um, and you can you'll, you'll see, you know, we've got you covered one way or the other. Um, we're also very proud to say that we have been the highest-rated product uh, in the history of CRN. Uh, you can see some awards down there at the bottom, and in fact. Um, not to, to bore you all with an eye chart, but I, I like to show this. This is the uh, from the CRN uh, ARC Awards in 2022 for IT infrastructure. And I'm using 2022 because there's a direct comparison here uh, with VMware. And you can see that not only was scale uh, the ultimate winner, um, but across all 20 some subcategories, uh, we were number one in every single one of the subcategories. Uh, and then last year, we actually beat uh, our own uh, best numbers. So that product quality and reliability rating that you see at the top and the overall score at the bottom, that's what is the highest rated score uh, in the history of CRN. So 
Um, perhaps scale is one of the best kept secrets out there if you're not one of our current customers, but we're here to help you uh, move forward from you know what's happened with uh, with VMware. And again, you know we do have global coverage. So if you're listening to uh, this recording, um, you know from anywhere in the world, uh, we have uh, reseller partners, MSPs, um, you know folks in the region that can help you. Uh, and show you, you know, like-minded individuals who are already running scale uh, in your your local geographies. So please reach out to us if you have any questions or if we can help uh, guide you to some some reference customers. Um, I will before I get into the demo. The last thing I'll talk about is that we do cover uh, customers of all shapes and sizes. So Coca Cola is one of our customers. Um, that's a deal that's managed by Accenture. Um, so that's at the very large end. On the other hand. Um, just, uh, last week I was actually on this podcast, but the, uh, two guys tech podcast, um, also, uh, running scale and, uh, that's managed by rich, uh, the gentleman on the left there, um, running a, uh, single server. Also they're actually running, um, one of these Intel NUX, um, for that, uh, for the infrastructure they were playing around with. So kind of runs the gamut, right? Coca-Cola is running AI applications on the factory floor. Um, on the other hand, you've got you know, a simple kind of, um, you know, home workbench type environment um, that we're talking about with two guys tech. So so we've got you covered across the board. So let's get into the actual product itself. And after I go through the basic demo, I'm also going to, to talk to you about how to move from a VMware environment or other environment, but obviously we're specifically talking about VMware today, but a VMware environment over to scale. And then finally, I'm going to close with kind of giving you a little bit of roadmap in terms of where we're taking things in the future. But the core product itself, again, SC Platform, is made up of two main components. Uh, one is called HyperCore. HyperCore is the operating system that exists on the servers themselves. So this is what you can think of as your primary one-for-one -one replacement for VMware. So this is going to be the hyperconverged storage, the virtualization layer, where the containers run, um, it's going to have built in that AIM layer for uh, high availability, disaster recovery, a lot of storage backend stuff like snapshotting and cloning and, and so forth is in there. And I'll show you all that in a demo. Uh, this exists again on uh, the actual server that's going to sit there on site uh, wherever you're running um, applications. That all then connects into something called Fleet Manager. And Fleet Manager is a central a portal-based system from which you can manage your entire environment. So whether your entire environment consists of one server in one location, or whether it's tens of thousands of servers across hundreds or thousands of locations, you can manage all of that together. And the point of Fleet Manager is it turns your on-prem environment, all of your hypercore deployments into a private cloud. And you're going to be able to manage that environment in, the, in a similar way that you might manage uh, AWS or GCP or Azure, right? So, so you get your own private cloud, um, whether you're that private cloud on the back end is a single server or hundreds or thousands uh, of servers. So let me dive in um, to the actual uh, demo here. And uh, we'll start at uh, Fleet Manager. So if you um, see, this is just uh, fleet.scalecomputing.com. I am logged in and I, I am zoomed in here to so make it easier for you guys to see the uh, the UI. But as I log in here in, in the environment I can manage, I've got 39 clusters deployed, um, You know, a bunch of nodes making up uh, all of those clusters. And I can see at a glance what the current condition is um, of all of those clusters. Now, normally we would hope that everything is nice and healthy. That makes for a pretty boring uh, demo. Um, so I've got an environment here that has a number of, of issues. So some are, are critical issues. I've got a drive failure. Um, so it's letting me know that if I lose more drives, um, I could have uh, some data loss. I've got um, you know other things that are hung up. You know, also, I've got just some warnings, um, things like uh, failure sending email alerts. I just didn't configure it um, on that particular cluster and so forth. So let's go in and look at um, the clusters themselves. Uh, and you can see these are the 39 clusters that I was referring to at a glance. I can see what's the kind of storage memory CPU utilization. I can also maintain my version control here. So you can see the current version number that I'm running. And with this little icon, if there is an update available, I can click that and trigger the update 
for that particular environment. One of the great things about the scale uh, SC platform uh, environment is that it, it is all completely integrated. Um, so I, I don't have to manage my storage separately from the virtualization, separately from uh, even the BIOS um, on the, the servers that are running. These are all prepackaged um, uh, version controls. So when I do have an update, I click that button, everything updates. I don't have downtime for that update. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that um, as well. I can also see there's a number of VMs running on, on each of these uh, particular clusters. So I'm just going to go in um, to uh, one of these clusters here. Um, we'll pick this one. And uh, you'll see at that first glance, I've got my historical metrics um, just over the past hour here. But you can see I can go all the way back over the last year as to what's happening. So if I had something you know, happen, I got a little spike in CPU. Obviously, it's very small, but you get the idea I can... Uh, troubleshoot that. This this cluster is healthy. There's no current conditions. Um, it is a three node cluster, so I can see the local IP addresses for those those nodes. And then down here, I can see the actual virtual machines that are running um, on that particular cluster. Now, what I'm going to do here from Fleet Manager is I'm going to click on this button in the upper right that says Go to Cluster. And that's going to actually take me to the local UI as though I were sitting there um, right in front of the cluster. And you have the option to manage your environment in both of these ways. You can manage just locally. Um, and I could I could connect them with a VPN as well. But in this case, um, when I go to cluster, you're going to see that little flash screen there that showed the scale logo. That's using something called Secure Link. And what Secure Link allows me to do is to access my local cluster from anywhere, uh, just using Fleet Manager. I don't need to use a VPN uh, to get in there. It's a it's a um, you know secure encrypted uh, tunnel that goes between Fleet Manager and um, the on-prem environment. And so this enables me to manage, um, like I said, without the use of VPNs. You can still use VPNs, and and more power to you. But we have learned over the years, especially for very large deployments where you might have hundreds or thousands um, of locations. Uh, the odds that all the VPNs are working at one time can be pretty slim. Um, and so this allows me to, you know, be on vacation, I can grab my phone, I can log into a cluster and I can see what's going on. Now, at the, the glance that I see here, I've got these big white boxes that you see are the actual workloads that are running uh, on this particular cluster. Again, I'm zoomed in um, to make it easier for uh, the demo purposes here, but you'd see a lot more in, in the normal view. Across the top, I have the three nodes. You can see the IP addresses represented there. I'm currently looking at the RAM. and um, You can see I have quite a bit of free RAM on these uh, systems. I can also look at the disks. Um, and I do have a mixed uh, environment here of uh, SSDs and SAS disks across this particular cluster. So right here, what I'm going to do is just show you the process of actually deploying um, a new a virtual machine um, is what I'll do in this case. Container would be very similar. So we'll just call this um, JR2. Um, I'm going to give it a name. Of course, I, I've got this concept of tagging, which allows me to take group actions um, and also do, you know, use the, um, the search uh, functionality and so forth. Uh, many customers will use lots of tags um, to say, oh, this is a Windows instance. This is a um, an instance that's running a particular database or, or what have you. I'm just going to use um, the one for reference here, Jeff. Um, and I can boot from um, lots of different things. We do support cloud in it. I've uploaded a number of ISO images um, to this particular cluster. So I'm just going to do a Windows 11 install. I hit create and that's it. So um, I, no, I didn't have to go configure storage any more than saying I needed um, you know, 100 uh, gig of storage for that particular uh, VM. And so you can see here, um, here is the actual uh, virtual machine that I created. I'm going to hit the power button and turn that on. And what's going to happen is it's going to automatically load balance across the cluster. It will pick one of these three servers to physically spin uh, that application up on on its own. Um, I happen to see it was very small, but it happened to pick uh, node number two. I can highlight it there. Uh, you can see node number two. Um, and if I uh, go into the console, uh, which is this button you see right here. Um, it'll be the exciting world of uh, installing Windows. So it'll take, there it goes. It takes a second to get that started. Now we're not going to watch the Windows install. Um, but what I think is, is really interesting here is from the instant that virtual machine has been created, it's already highly available. So we're, we're installing the underlying guest OS, 
but I could come in here, for example, and I could do um, a live migration of that VM right now. So I can click these, this arrow and I want say I want to move it from node two over here to node one. Um, and that's going to take about 15 seconds or so for that, uh, that migration to happen. And this is the equivalent in VMware terms of a vMotion with a storage vMotion, um, which could take uh, hours in some cases. In this case, it takes just a few seconds. And we actually use this um, same technology uh, many times when you're doing uh, things like updates. So you see there is uh, an update available for this particular cluster. Um, if I click the update available, uh, you'll see I've got the, the opportunity to read the release notes and so forth. I'm not going to apply the update here, but if this particular update required um, a reboot um, because something had changed, maybe in the BIOS, for example, that will happen on a node by node basis. And so what would happen, just like I migrated that workload over here to node number one, which you see is now complete. Um, if we had to update node one, it would evacuate node one, live migrate the applications off of it, update the node. When the node comes back online, move the applications back and proceed to node two and node three. Now, many updates don't require a reboot. You don't have to worry about all that. But the point is you can apply those kinds of updates you know, at lunchtime on Tuesday, not during a, a 2 a.m. Friday maintenance window, uh, which is really nice from an administrative standpoint. So um, so that uh, that workload is moved over, the install continues and, and so forth. And so the other thing I want to talk about is is high availability. So now I've got, imagine I've got this three node cluster. Um, I'm not physically sitting in front of this cluster, but I do want to show you uh, something very similar. So on this particular cluster that we're looking at here, um, what I do is I pull the power cord on the third node in the cluster. And you're going to see some alerts pop up in the UI, and you're going to see that node report as going offline. But what's most important is in the next few seconds, you're going to see the workloads that were reporting as running on node number three will now report as running on node one or node two. So what I've had here is sudden catastrophic failure. Um, I've had multiple, you know, in this case, maybe I had 12 drives fail at the same time with a server, all my applications are still up and running. And the way that that works, and it's the same reason that the live migration could happen so quickly, uh, is that every block of data that exists for both this virtual machine, as well as its underlying storage, exists in multiple locations in the cluster in active state on a block by block basis. And so when suddenly any of the blocks that were available on node number three were no longer there, um, it was able to just redirect those reason writes to um, the active block that existed somewhere else in the cluster. This is why the storage vMotion equivalent happens so quickly. This is why you're able to have that kind of cord pull failure and everything stays up and running. Um, and so this is, this is critical kind of in all environments. But if you're in uh, edge computing, which is one of the um, common use cases we're seeing these days where you're deploying infrastructure maybe at the far reaches of, of what would be your network. Maybe you're in retail and it's the back of a retail store or on board a ship or a truck uh, or, or you know on the factory floor, right? It can be very challenging to get your IT staff into those locations to deal with failures. And so rather than have a downtime scenario when you have something like a server failure, uh, the applications in this case are still running. You can get out there and change that server um, whenever you know it, it makes more sense on your schedule. Or in fact, um, as I'll show you in a little bit, uh, perhaps just ship a new server there and have the store manager uh, make the change. You don't need to be uh, sophisticated IT in order to uh, make changes and manage a system like scale. And we're going to show you a little bit about that um, here momentarily. The the other thing I want to talk about is complete site failure, disaster recovery, business continuity um, that I mentioned earlier. And so if you look, here's this, this workload that we created. Um, if I click this button, you'll see there's a new uh, option that shows up that's called setup replication. Uh, when I click that button, I get a drop down box of any other cluster which I have given this cluster access to. So this might be a true DR site. Um, this might be a virtual instance of scale running in the public cloud. Uh, this might be just another physical location. Perhaps it's uh, store number one uh, replicating to store number two. In any case, I pick my target, hit replicate, and literally that is all it takes to set up 
uh, disaster recovery. So what's actually going to happen here um, is the system is going to take a snapshot on whatever schedule I select. You can see I just use the default, which is going to be every 15 minutes, but you can set this up however you like. Um, it's going to take a snapshot of the workload and its storage and then replicate that over the WAN to the remote site. And um, it's obviously going to kick that off here in a little bit. Once that's done, um, it'll take a while to replicate that data, but I'll get a timestamp here that says um, everything is up and running at, uh, at that remote site. And if I go to, um, to that remote site, uh, which is VLB04, um, got that here, and you can see here is the JR2 um, container, if you will. Um, you can see the timestamp doesn't exist and the snapshot's not there yet, but this is where it's going to go. It's automatically created that location and it's going to start replicating uh, that over earlier before I started this, kind of like I'm, I'm showing a, a cooking show, right? I did start one earlier called JR1 and you can see that snapshot uh, is there. Now, if I did in fact have a failure at my primary site, what I would do is I would come on to the remote location. Um, I can look at my snapshots. In this case, I have just the one um, that I'm replicating every 15 minutes. Um, and I can say, okay, let's clone off of any snapshot I've got. Um, I'm just going to pick the, the only one that we have. And you'll see um, it created, cloned off of that snapshot. I now have a VM. I power that VM on and I can point my DNS over to it and I'm back up and running. Uh, so this is extraordinarily easy to do. Um, you can take thousands and thousands of snapshots per uh, per workload with no impact to your storage performance um, and your system performance. That's very different than what you may be used to with, um, with VMware. Um, but you can see how, just how easy that was. Now, if I do all of this except for pointing my DNS over to the failure, Right, I have a very nice built-in test dev environment. So I can come over here, I can apply patches, I can screw around with this particular workload and say, okay, all that seems fine. And then I just want to power that thing back off and delete it because um, I don't actually need to use this thing. And you can see it's it's all sort of very, very easy uh, to do. And while I was talking there, um, the snapshot for JR2 has completed. Um, so you can see we've got the nice timestamp there. Um, that allows us to um, see exactly what's going on. And back at that primary location, um, you can see uh, there we go and the transmission and so forth. So all all very, very um, easy to do. Again, take lots and lots of snapshots if you like. Uh, cloning things is very easy. The cloning is also very useful when you're deploying new uh, workloads manually. Everything can be scripted, but if I were deploying manually, I might rather than install from a base ISO image as I did in our Windows instance here that I was showing you, what I might have is a, a gold master image of everything set up like I'd like to, and then just um, just clone off of, uh, of that. So you've got, as I said, to, to wrap this piece of the, the demo up, you have local high availability, cord pull test that I showed you, everything keeps running. You also have built-in disaster recovery uh, which is uh, is really handy. Um, you can fail over. You can also fail back, uh, which is great. Lots of customers. We have customers in areas subject to hurricanes and so forth. They regularly will uh, fail out of state. Um, if they're in Florida, for example, uh, once the hurricane passes, they then they then fail back. Um, so this actually gets used uh, quite a bit on a uh, a frequent basis. So let me jump back over to uh, Fleet Manager here. And let's let's imagine um, that you are a brand new scale customer, right? So you wouldn't see all of these particular uh, clusters running. Um, it would be blank because you don't have anything. So we would want to come in here and I'll click this button in the upper right that says add a cluster. And what add a cluster is going to do, it's going to ask me to give it a name, um, give it some basic IP information. And I'm going to go over to this button that says add a node. And what's interesting here, when I click add a node, um, I'm going to get a list of all of the systems and licenses I have purchased from scale uh, that have not yet been deployed. Um, it maybe hasn't even shipped. In this case, you can see I've got some that have blank ship dates if I were buying a, a system from scale and some that have shipped. Um, but what I'm able to do is I can come in here and say, okay, even before I get my hands on uh, any system, I'm going to add a couple nodes to the cluster 
uh, like so. And you'll see those pop up down here. And I'm going to say, okay, let's define what the, again, IP addresses, basic networking information is. You can see the software license that gets assigned uh, to these, these nodes, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm good to go. So I can configure all this ahead of time. I can even go so far as to um, configure an initial playbook that says, hey, once this system shows up on site, um, what I want it to do is I want it to not only have this network configuration, but I want it to download and install this set of applications and configure that set of applications. So to, to showcase that a little bit, and, and this is, we call this zero touch deployment. Um, and it, it really helps uh, in, in those environments where you're going to have lots of deployments. You can use it even if you only have one. Um, but if you have an environment with many deployments, like a retail store, for example, uh, this can be very handy. So I've actually asked uh, my nephew, uh, John, to demo this for us. Now, John is eight years old, and this is his bedroom. Um, and I'm just going to show you this, this video. He's going to come on screen, and he's going to unbox and uh, plug in a system. Now, he's using a one of our HE150 uh, family systems, which is an Intel NUC. Um, but again, we have servers that range from little tiny devices like this at the edge all the way through uh, traditional rack mount, you know, one U, two U, four U uh, rack gear. But the point here is that in order to stand up a new location, all you have to do is plug in power and network, turn it on, and effectively wait for the light to turn green. So what's going to happen is once it's on, John's going to give us a thumbs up there, indicating everything is good to go. It's going to reach out to the fleet manager portal, download its configuration. Um, roll that configuration out, and then you can see the green check marks appear there. Everything is up and running. And, and when I say everything is up and running, what I mean is not only did the initial system get configured, but it did download and configure actual applications uh, that are running. Now, that was a single node system, so that wasn't clustered. Um, but you can imagine in a clustered environment, it would work exactly the same way. Um, so it's it's trivially easy to do. And and the point of this, and we sort of were solving a problem that we saw customers that had these edge computing deployments struggle with, is the most expensive part of an edge computing deployment is putting somebody in one of those white trucks with a ladder on top and sending them on site to do something. And so enabling um, somebody with less technical skills who might already be on site to be able to simply unbox and plug something in um, can really streamline the operation. Now, you're welcome to send a tech, of course, but it is very, very easy to do. Now, the other place where zero touch um, provisioning, as well as the, the other high availability stuff I talked about comes into play, is in the situation of break fix. And so imagine that uh, John, you know, the, the cluster that, that John set up on his bed there was a three node cluster, like I demoed before, and we had a node failure. Um, so what are we going to do in that node failure scenario? Well, what can happen here is you can simply send a new node out to that location and have a store manager, again, uh, just go ahead and change it. So in this case, um, I had John's sister, my niece, Elizabeth, um, go ahead and is going to help us out here. So she, Elizabeth ha has a three node cluster and she has a uh, dead node in the system. Now, Elizabeth is five years old, uh, but she's going to show us just how easy it is to actually change a system. So she plugs in the new node, everything's still up and running, turns it on, gives us a similar thumbs up to John. What you're gonna see here is that that node um, is going to be added to the cluster and everything is back up and running. And so what then happens is you take the dead node, you either throw it away or put it in the box and send it back. You're gonna replace your systems in a similar way that you know uh, Apple might change your, your iPhone if it died. They send you a new phone, your applications migrate over to it, you send the dead phone um, back in, in a cardboard box, right? So it's meant to really streamline the operations to keep your team out of the, the mundane and the, the tasks in the field if, if they don't need to be there and ultimately make it very easy to keep your applications up and running uh, at all times. So let's jump back over here. Oh, one more thing I did want to show you, sorry, in the... Um, in the environment is um, is migrating from uh, from something like VMware. So you have a couple of different options. I can right here is a button uh, to import um, 
uh, VMs. So I can actually export my, my VMDK from VMware and just drag and drop it into here um, and import that VMDK and spin that, that virtual machine up. It'll automatically convert it over to scale and you're up and running. Now, if you're going to do one or two or three VMs, right, that's a very easy way to do it built in. But if I have hundreds or thousands of virtual machines, right, exporting them individually and importing them individually can be a pain. And so we do have another option, um, which is um, with our friends from uh, Acronis. And so Acronis has a, a free offering um, called Convert to VM. Acronis is one of the backup providers that's supported by scale, not the only one, um, but you can do host level backup, uh, ransomware protection and so forth with uh, with Acronis. But also they have this, this conversion tool. And what this allows you to do is set up um, a Cronus in your VMware environment um, and say, okay, these you know, you'll tag the particular virtual machines you want to convert, click the button, and one at a time, it will then script and migrate all of those workloads over to scale with minimal downtime. Um, and so we actually have uh, environments where this happens automatically every day, right? If a new VMware uh, some, some customers use this if they're going to use scale as a disaster recovery target for their VMware environment, for example. If a new VMware uh, VM shows up, it automatically sends it over to scale. Um, more and more these days, it's just meant to be a one-way conversion. So customers are migrating off of VMware, uh, but it's very, very easy to do. You sort of set it up once, hit the button and let it rip. Right, and so it'll migrate all of your workloads um, one at a time until it is uh, complete. And you can do that without using uh, the Acronis backup product. Um, if you do want to use the Acronis backup product, the nice thing is you'll already have it configured by the time that you do this, but you're not required to license and use uh, that particular um, backup product if you choose not to, if you want to use something else like um, a Veeam or, or something like that. Um, so the, the last thing I want to talk about is the kind of nuts and bolts of, uh, of getting things moved over. Um, and that has to do with our uh, seamless switch campaign. So one of the things um, you'll find with scale is that your total cost of ownership is substantially reduced compared to a VMware environment. Uh, we've had third parties, and you can find this on our website, do an analysis uh, by interviewing customers and and sort of pricing out, well, how much time do they spend on administration? What was the absolute cost of the, the software and the hardware they were running on, et cetera. And under the old VMware pricing, we were typically about 70% less expensive, uh, which is a lot, needless to say. Under the new VMware pricing, who knows, right? We haven't done uh, a new survey, but when you're looking at three, four, five X price increases, obviously it's going to be uh, quite a bit less. Um, However, we do recognize that you may be in the middle of your VMware license, right? You may still have six months of time remaining. Uh, you may have just purchased uh, hardware recently and, and weren't wanting to, to migrate. So we do have a campaign running called the Seamless Switch Campaign. So under the Seamless Switch Campaign, you have a couple of options. If you have VMware term remaining, um, we will... Uh, credit you free software on scale for whatever that remaining term is. So if you have six months of time left uh, with VMware and you want to use scale, we'll give you six months of scale for free um, when you make that migration. Alternatively, uh, perhaps you have hardware uh, that you recently purchased, um, which for one reason or another is not on the scale computing hardware compatibility list. Um, if that is the case, we will uh, give you credit to trade in that hardware and provide you with new hardware uh, with your scale software license already on there. So we can be very aggressive here, um, including, you know, we recognize that some of you may have purchased hardware just nine or 12 months ago uh, before you realized what was going to happen with uh, the software licensing from VMware. And so we've got you covered there. We're also providing the tools to perform these migrations. So that Acronis tool, um, as well as some others, we have different options depending on, on your particular needs. But we are providing those tools for free. We're also providing advanced training uh, and an invite to um, our Platform 2025 conference in Las Vegas, uh, which is going to be similar to your VM world, um, where our partners and customers and so forth all come together. Uh, it's a great event. Um, if you guys do come over to the Scale family, we would love to have you there uh, next year. And so to, to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the future, because I think that 
what can be missed here in the panic over how do I switch from VMware and, and what are the alternatives out there? Um, you know, it, there's a, an old saying, which is, you know, cool heads win games, right? And so if you remain, remain cool uh, through this, this challenge, right, not only can you say, okay, I do need to make a move from VMware, but when I make that move, can I make a move in a way that builds a roadmap for the future of my organization, right? And I would argue that that's exactly what scale is doing. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about about what edge computing is is really all about, right? And it's easy to think that edge is just a location, right? It's it's just the back of that grocery store or that truck and I'm going to run a couple of workloads there. Um, but it's actually much more than that. And we're seeing the rise of of artificial intelligence based applications, computer vision and large language models where things like running the inference part of these AI models is far less expensive to run on-prem on your own infrastructure than it is to run in the cloud. That's just one of the drivers that's moving things to the edge. But if we roll the clock back to the early days of uh, cloud computing, um, so I pulled this um, you know, somewhat fuzzy diagram from, uh, from Gartner. This is Gartner's view of uh, cloud computing back in 2010. Um, so about 14 years ago. And you can see that back in 2010, Gartner called the leaders in cloud computing companies like Verizon and AT&T, right? Which is laughable at this point. You can see Amazon there is listed as a visionary. Uh, Google and Microsoft are nowhere to be seen, right? So what's going on here, right? Well, what's going on is that in the early days of cloud computing, the cloud was viewed as a place to run applications. It was a great big data center. And so what you have here is a list of large data centers. And the, the thinking was, well, what we're going to do is some customers are going to want to migrate workloads from their data center into these sort of larger cloud style data centers. And so that was the thinking. Of course, now when we look today, right, and you look at the leaders in cloud, it's completely different. It's AWS and GCP and Microsoft and so forth. And, and the key here is that these are the organizations that recognized that the cloud was not a, just a location to host an application. They'll certainly do that. But it was an entire platform that changed the way applications were deployed, applications were managed, and even applications were created, right? It's not about just migrating workloads from the data center to the cloud. But the reality is today, Many, you know, hundreds of thousands of applications exist in the cloud, not because they ever existed in the data center, but they were created in the cloud. And that's where we're, we're going with, with edge computing. And hopefully when you saw a little bit of the management of scale and that ability to do zero touch deployments, um, and there's so much more that, you know, we could show you in a longer form demo to you know, integrate Ansible playbooks and be able to manage my entire infrastructure um, in a, in a GitOps ops style where it's automatically pulling down applications as changes are made to configuration files, right? That is, that is where things are going. And it's a whole new era of computing. It's not that the edge is just um, on-prem remote office, branch office again, right? The edge is something different. It is something that's a, a hybrid between, you know, um, cloud style management of infrastructure um, with the flexibility that on-prem infrastructure brings you without burdening you with managing things like underlying hardware and BIOS and, and updates and, and that kind of stuff. And that's what we're, we're really all about at scale. So we would love to talk to you more about your environment, about this roadmap and, and the vision that we have for the future um, as it it's, could be useful. You can find us all over the internet. We have you know thousands of reviews and case studies published online. Uh, you can find these links from our website as well. In fact, I, I would invite you all to come to the website um, because there's a few things there which you know I, I know sometimes you might find with different vendors in IT are hard to locate, right? So right in the upper right-hand corner of our website is a big button that says pricing. Um, so you can configure a system and see what pricing might look like for you. Um, now there's you know literally hundreds of thousands of possible configurations. So if you don't see something in that pricing tool that seems to match, just contact us. There's live chat right on the website as well. There's a button to schedule a demo where we can get on and give you a deeper dive than what I was able to show you here. Also on this slide, you can see my name, uh, my email very cleverly, jeff at scalecomputing.com. You are welcome to reach out directly to me 
and I will uh, guide you, or maybe I'll do the demo for you uh, myself. I'm often happy to uh, do that. And then finally, the QR code that you see there, if you scan that code, that's going to take you into um, the details of the seamless switch offer, which I talked about earlier. So that's the system exchange, uh, that's the free migration tool, and the uh, the invite to Platform 2025. So again, uh, my name is Jeff Reedy. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to talk to you more about your environment, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks so much.